All right, we'll officially get started. So good afternoon. Uh, I'm Becca Truman, the watershed coordinator for the Curry's Fork Watershed. So I'm really glad that you're here. And I know we've been talking about how it's raining out. So I'll do my best to keep the energy up for us here this afternoon. And this is our first stakeholder meeting of 2021. We're gonna focus on citizen science, wastewater management and human health today. And then we've got some great speakers coming in to talk about the Oldham County Health Department. And then uh, MSD is gonna be here to talk about their management of the Oldham County sewer systems, which they took over last year. So some of you here today are gonna be a little less familiar with this work. So just to get us all up to speed quickly, uh, here on the left, we can see the Curry's Fork watershed this is the watershed that we're focused on. And this work, um, it needs to be targeted within specific watersheds because that's the area of land that has influence on the streams. So when we're noticing issues with our streams, we need to look at the land that influences those streams if we're gonna target water quality improvements. And that's where we start to talk about these sub watersheds. So, if you are in, you are always in a watershed and it's just really easy when we think about watersheds as these Russian nesting dolls. I put a picture here of them if you, if you don't recall what they are, maybe you don't know, but it's just the idea that you're always in a watershed and it just depends on the scale of what we're looking at. So some of the work that we do, we target uh, water quality improvements at this sub watershed scale and those sub watersheds in the Curry's Fork watershed include North Fork, Curry's Fork, South Fork, Curry's Fork, Asher's Run, and then the Curry's Fork main stem here. So in terms of our water quality impairments, we know that the streams in the Curry's Fork do not meet water quality standards. We consider them to potentially be a risk to human health because we're finding above acceptable levels of bacteria as well as a, oops, sorry about that, as well as a risk to aquatic wildlife populations because we're finding below acceptable levels of oxygen for aquatic wildlife. So this map itself is a map of the Oldham County streams and these main streams we have here in Oldham County have been assessed by the Division of Water to determine if they are meeting water quality impairments. So along this top, portion here of the watershed, we have Harrods Creek, which for the most part is meeting those water quality criteria, but the Curry Fork here circled and those red streams uh, is not. And then below that in Oldham County, we have Floyd's Fork, which is also not meeting the EPA water quality standards. And ultimately the Curry Fork watershed, that water leads into Floyd's Fork. So we have this great document, we call this our watershed plan. This was completed and approved by EPA in 2012. And so Oldham County started the Curry's Fork Watershed Program in about 2004. And what this document does for us is it outlines both the suspected sources of pollution in the watershed at that sub watershed scale that I mentioned, so targeting specific areas. And then more importantly, it provides these solutions or these best management practices. So how are we gonna target those pollution reductions? And there's um, we call it a multi-pronged approach to do that. Looking at Kentucky as a whole, we talked about streams that don't meet bacteria criteria, which includes Curry's Fork. So this map here includes all those streams that Division of Water has monitored and uh, identifies if they are meeting that bacteria, those bacteria levels. And most of the streams that have been monitored are not meeting um, that MAC or above that maximum level of bacteria that it's okay to identify in the stream. So 80% of these streams in Kentucky that have been monitored by the Division of Water are considered impaired. But when we look at the areas in Kentucky that have these initiatives, for watershed planning, there's much fewer areas in total than the whole, than all of those areas that have water quality issues. So I think it's just really important to point out that this program is very unique and 
And it's really great that we continue to have uh, support by both Oldham County Fiscal Court, as well as Division of Water, as well as the people here today. So who are the stakeholders? So this is where we say those that live, work and play in the Curry's Fork watershed. Normally these meetings, we call them our technical advisory committee meeting because we're, we're focused on bringing this cross section of advisory group together. So professionals that have uh, technical expertise, knowledge and can help guide and assist with these water quality improvement efforts that we're trying to do. But I also think it's important to include the public because we, we can't be successful without that public participation and buy-in. So I sort of rebranded this as a stakeholder group because I wanna make sure everyone is aware if they have an interest in this work, then we want them to be involved in these meetings and we wanna get their input. And we are still aiming to meet that three time, those three times a year. Been on my presentation here, try to keep us on time as much as possible. But we have a lot going on with this program, and I'm going to hit some of the highlights as of late. So, citizen science engagement, some water quality monitoring, and some other program updates to mention. Okay, so it is citizen science month. So I wanted to start thinking about how to bring some potential citizen <laughs> science out of all the engagement we've been having. But in general, um, we, we're mostly going to talk, talk on this broader topic of engagement. Um, but I think of citizen science as maybe a subset overall of engagement. I am finding that uh, as residents start engaging more and more they start to make some really uh, critical connections and they're part of all this and they want more and they want to engage more. So I think thinking about more opportunities for that citizen engagement piece, uh, more long-term engagement and monitoring and personal exploration um, as people start to maybe make some changes at home and in their broader communities. But I'm gonna kind of run through fairly quickly some of some of the different activities and programs that we've been working on. And I mentioned earlier solutions identified in the watershed plan. So these six are really our main initiatives when we think about how we're targeting those water quality improvements. Friends of Curry's Fork, this is our local watershed group and we kicked this off last June. This has mostly been, um, this has been meetups that happen mostly month to month, not every month. Um, we're trying to hit every month, or at least I am. And we're averaging probably about one to five people each time. Um, we're still building momentum. This is sort of a weird group to ask people to join in if they don't have any really previous knowledge about watersheds and water quality. And of course, everybody's already stretched very thin to begin with, but Again, as people start to engage more, um, we're, finding, we're finding those more connections and more interest. And I will see that, say that we're getting the most interest when, um, when there is a provided opportunity for some real action. And I'm gonna talk about plantings in a little bit here. Uh, in May, we're gonna meet in person at the Oldham Reserve. And this is gonna be, uh, the Oldham Reserve is just really a great place. It's a public site to get people out and we are looking at um, building public trails, hopefully. And we've also been doing plantings at the Oldham Reserve. So having that be kind of a main place for us to meet has been, um, has been really great. Uh, been utilizing Facebook a lot more. So we have our Friends of Curry Sport Group on Facebook. And as of today, we are up to 66 members. So end of January, early February, we had these stormwater management sessions. These were quick 30 minute sessions focused on stormwater topics that are relevant to Oldham County. Uh, Dave Gamstetter with the Davy Resource Group provided these. Over these three sessions, we had 10 attendees on Zoom, but uh, using utilizing the recording, recorded video, videos and Facebook, we've had over 200 views on Facebook of these videos. And then in March, we held this Oldham Reserve Information Session. This was an online session where um, myself, Kirsten Fuchs, and David uh, Bazanas 
got together and provided about an hour long information session talking about what the Oldham Reserve is. A lot of people aren't aware of that as a public site jointly owned by the city of LaGrange in Oldham County. We talked about environmental considerations for development of that site, plans for development, and then the Curry's Fork initiatives. So that I just mentioned the streamside plantings and the development of those public trails. So in terms of attendance, we had about um, 21 people attend on Zoom and we've had quite a few views after the fact on Facebook as well. We held this at-home conservation workshop. This was a couple of weekends ago and it's been a real pleasure to work with UDL Botanical Gardens with these events. They've helped a ton in terms of logistics for events, getting the word out, ticketing um, and everything else. So this was all about, you know, people being at home, thinking about what we can do on our properties. So I had Andrea Matz with the Conservation District discuss some of Conservation District's programming. Margaret Shea with Dropsy Native Plant Nursery, of course, discussing native plants and how to incorporate those into your landscape. And then I gave kind of an over, overview of practices that we can implement at home and understanding sort of our individual role in helping biodiversity, uh, helping streams and how collectively that can really make a significant difference. And we had 18 people attend that workshop. That workshop was a prerequisite to our rain barrel cost share program. So I'm in the midst of this right now. And I've had 12 people request rain barrels who attended that workshop. This is a 40-60 cost share where participants are going to pay 40% for the cost of their rain barrel and kit. And then the grant is going to pay 60%. Uh, the engineering department has also put in some money for this. So those who are not in the Curry's Fork watershed but uh, attended that workshop are able to participate in this cost share as well. So that's been really great. And uh, I gave quite a few options for rain barrels because you just don't know what people are gonna want, but regardless, um, they are gonna pay 40%. So uh, in case you're all wondering, most people were interested in this one at the bottom right. And then another big effort this spring, this has been our planting events, how to harvest live stakes workshop and our giveaway. So we held two planting events on private property and I called these neighborhood events just to give a little more context about these. My vision here is to focus on planting live stakes. So um, increasing our riparian buffer along the streams on this sort of neighborhood scale because oftentimes if I get a call from somebody and they have an issue, they live along the stream, they've noticed their stream eroding. Well, it's not an isolated event. Chances are all of their neighbors that also live along the stream are gonna have similar issues. So my ultimate goal is to be able to, to hold an event as a neighborhood event, inviting anybody in that neighborhood. And it's gonna take a little bit of time to sort of continue to build these but once, once we start to do these, so we've done two so far. So now I have two neighborhoods in the Curry's Fork watershed where there's people in those, those neighborhoods that have done this and they have the knowledge on how to do it. So if I have somebody else call me and I can look up where they live and say they live in one of those neighborhoods, now I have a place I can go out to their property and, and talk about the idea of planting trees and live stakes along their stream. And now we can walk down the street to see um, another property that was done that we planted these. And then you also have the knowledge base. So you have the people that know how to do it. So it's just the idea of creating this more community effort in repairing our streams, as opposed to me one-on-one -on -one trying to work with people. We also had uh, one event at the Oldham Reserve and in total we had 27 volunteers participate. The other piece of, second piece of this was our How to Harvest Live Stakes workshop. So the idea that harvesting live stakes is actually really simple and trying to build that knowledge base of people that know how to harvest them. This was really successful. We had six people participate and um, everybody had a great time just to see how easy it was. Now they know where they can go. And then we also did a giveaway. So for people that um, want to take some trees home and plant on their property. 
So we have about 16 people participate in the giveaway and plant on their on the stream on their property. In total, we had about 600 bare root seedlings and about 700 live stakes planted. Connecting back to opportunities for citizen science. So now you have homeowners who have engaged with this. They've planted trees along their stream. They already have that prior concern of stream erosion. So they can start to see, is this working? The success rate of these live stakes of these trees, maybe looking at the growth, um, stream improvements long-term. So there could be an opportunity for programming there. And then in our grant, we also have some funding for stream monitoring kits through Salt River Watershed Watch. So it might be a good idea to try to target some of these people that have planted along their stream for going out and monitoring on a regular basis as you would with the Salt River Watershed Watch. And just lots of really awesome pictures. Uh, I wanted to, to show some here. So we had a lot of people all ages uh, take part in this and if you are interested in this, then I encourage you to participate when we have our next events. And just pointing out uh, more ways to engage people. So I started a YouTube page recently. Uh, it's, it's not very popular yet, <laughs> but um, if you're not on Facebook, it's just another way to access information. So while we have videos, it just makes sense to put them out in different places. All right, I'm gonna take a breath there and we're gonna talk about water quality monitoring. So I had sent out a document earlier today. You should have got it in your email. And let's see, if you wanna to refer to that, if you don't have it, that's okay, but um, just note that it, it did send it out and I hope people were able to, to pull that up. So the MS4 program, they started funding this water quality monitoring effort last year. So their intention is year by year to go into different watersheds within Oldham County and monitor for E. coli and other parameters, water quality parameters. So uh, logically, they started with Curry's Fork Watershed. So this was last year, and there were 11 sites that were monitored. So all except one of these, which was just moved slightly because the stream had moved in the past 15 years, but for the most part, all of them were the same exact locations that were sampled in the watershed plan. So there was these five sampling dates in May and June. And I think it's important with this water quality data that we don't wanna make too many conclusions and try to take too much out of this that doesn't exist. Um, ideally, we'd love to really compare to the watershed plan. Um, we can't really do that here. There's, there are some conclusions that I think we can draw, but I think it's important to, to provide this data to you and to show you what information was collected. So in the watershed plan for that monitoring, each of these 11 sites had between 10 and 30 samples per site. So here we're talking about five. And then in terms of what was tested, E. coli was tested last year, but during the watershed plan development, fecal coliform was tested. And that's just because those criteria have changed over time. And it's better to test for E. coli because that's where you're getting into determining really what is your potential risk for viruses in the bacteria you're finding in the watershed. So referring to the standards, the um, standards for water quality for bacteria. And if this is new or confusing, um, I don't wanna muddy the waters too much, but we're basically, the idea is that we wanna look at these five samples and determine where they fall in within these standards to, to bacteria. So looking at E. coli, um, we either need to say, did the geometric mean for these samples, did it exceed 130 colonies? And then the second part of this is how many of those samples exceeded 240 colonies. So it's um, colonies per 100 milliliters. So there's a dilution there when that gets tested. So again, you'll see this more clearly on that handout, but all of the sites um, are non-supporting for primary contact recreation. What that's saying is Referring to those standards, none of these sites 
had low enough bacteria to qualify as meeting the standards for bacteria, um, which we also consider that primary contact recreation. Can, is it safe to swim in that water? Is there a risk? Uh, the exception here is the outlet of Crystal Lake, which had really good results except for one day. And so because all except one of the results did meet criteria, we consider that partial support. Um, when it comes to actual change designations through the division of water, so stepping back and saying, you know, what is the whole purpose of this program? What are our goals? Well, we know that the streams don't meet water quality standards. We want to do everything we can and implement all these solutions and then ultimately go out and test and meet those water quality standards. But when you're looking at the streams, you have to have the whole length of that stream meet the standard to really switch it to say it does meet standards. So part of North Fork is meeting standards at partial support, but the rest is not. So we're still considering, um, at least for now, that that whole entire stream is not supporting the water quality standards. Um, so I did mention Crystal Lake did have one higher value and in the highest value was during low flow. So thinking more about this, we can, we can kind of dig into, well, if there's low flow, then our sources of pollution are probably more likely to be some type of point source. Whereas, whereas when the flow conditions are higher, that's where you're getting all of that non-point source pollution running off to the stream and contributing to those bacteria levels. Um, all in all, much higher E. coli levels on all these sites during high flow events, except for that Crystal Lake outlet. And I'll just point out that, um, that one of those dates, I think it's the fourth date there, June 23rd, um, those sites where it says uh, 2420 colonies per 100 mLs, that's because the detect that's the detection rate on that test. And that means the values of E. coli were actually higher than the detection rate. So we don't really know what that value was. We know it was really high. Becca, do you all take you take questions on uh, this as we're moving through? Go ahead, yeah. I, I just was wondering on the the high, uh, you talked about the six twenty three uh, numbers or whatever that was a high flow. I assume we'd had a, a lot of rain, a large rain event. Is that at that time? Is that correct? Uh, you have, can you be more specific about where you're referring to? Uh, yes, on the sampling sites on the date of six twenty three twenty, okay. it showed a high stream flow. And so I would assume that was uh, after a large rain event. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, exactly. So that's a good connection there. If the, the flow in the stream is higher, that's in response to a rain event. Okay, all right. Does that clarify? Yes, yes okay. ma'am. I know yes. this, is, um, this can be really confusing and it's not, it's not personally my wheelhouse either. So um, I'm probably breezing through it a little bit quickly, but... Um, kind of looking more about what we can sort of look at with these results. So Curry's Fork, I mentioned, the water that leaves Curry's Fork goes into Floyd's Fork. So what is the quality of the water based on this testing when it's getting to Floyd's Fork? So it's the outlet of Curry's Fork on an average of those five samples, we're looking at 522 colonies per 100 mLs, which really isn't that bad. Um, it's not meeting standards, but it's not you know, 2000 on an average. So there is a lot of dilution as uh, pollution is added and uh, by the time it gets to the outlet. Um, in terms of where the worst site was, so this highest mean based on those five, those five sampling points, the highest was in South Fork at West Moody Lane. So that's this area right here um, before it's at that in 2012, there was a big restoration project done on West Moody Lane. It's before the Lakewood Valley treatment plant. And um, so we haven't talked a ton about South Fort Curry's Fork within this group as a bacteria, um, a place where we're really concerned about bacteria, but we're seeing, we're seeing that being the highest, at least with these results. Okay, I mentioned dilution. So, um, so I gave an example here where where North Fork, so both North Fork and South Fork merge together and they join into Curry's Fork. 
So North Fork, as it's outletting before it gets to Curry's Fork, it's 526. South Fork, before it gets to Curry's Fork, is 746. So the number that we see when they merge together is 665, which is a logical number that we'd expect with those two streams combining together. So just thinking more about as the water's slowing downstream, what those numbers look like and thinking, you know, does this kind of make sense? And thinking about applications for this. So the main application right now for Curry's Fork, our programming is thinking about these priority areas for septic repairs. And we refer to our pathogen priority map, which is, which is what we've been looking at for a long time. And it's a product of the watershed plan to say, where do we need to target bacteria reductions the most? And typically we've been looking at Upper Asher's Run, that's where our target area was for our septic program last time. And we're gonna keep targeting that area and, and we're not really seeing anything just based on the results from the sampling last year that would suggest that we don't continue to use, these, use this map and prioritize both Upper Asher's Run as well as this area within North Fork and South Fork as well. Potential further applications. So uh, Oldham MS4, they've been doing this mapping in the field to map their MS4 infrastructure, which includes headwalls, pipes, outfalls, swale ditches, and catch basins. Um, this is not something I'm involved with this. this um, so maybe either Derek or Jim, you might have something to add to this. But I think if we can sort of try to connect the data to maybe some more what's happening on the ground, there might be there might be some conclusions we can draw or something lead us into different directions as far as some of this work at some point. But I just wanted to point out um, MS4 did collect this data. So what their further applications might be in addition to how this is helping the Curry's Fork program. And I'll pause there for a second before I wrap up if anybody has anything to ask or add. Uh, Becca, I had uh, one question on the, the data that you looked at here. This was just a one point in time, one day. It, it's not, you're not showing the data over, over time on this, correct? So there were five day, there are five samples collected at each of the 11 sites. Okay. So there was, they, were they collected over a, a period of time or just one point in time? I guess I'm not sure what you. Well, it, it, I, you know, it, it's a, a little hard to tell, you know, from from one. I see a date or well, some different dates here, but I wasn't sure whether this data was collected on, you know, just one day or whether it was collected over, you know, a period of time, a month or two months or okay. a year or that kind of thing. Let me clarify this a little bit and see if that answers your question. So um, the team went out to monitor and when they went out, say they went out, I think, May 27th might have been that first day. Mm -hmm. so they went out May 27th and they took a sample at each of these 11 sites. Okay. And then All they right. went out May 29th and they did 11 sites. And then they did that three more times in June. Okay. All right. And they went to the same sites each time, mm -hmm. but five different times. Okay. I think that answers Kevin's question. Yeah. It does. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about the confusion. I'm gonna wrap up here and just a couple other quick program updates. We've applied for a couple of grants this year, one through the US Fish and Wildlife Foundation, their five star and urban waters restoration grant. This is a $50,000 grant and we'll find out in August if we were funded. There were several, there are several partners who work together to get this grant. Um, put together and submitted. So we have the Oldham LaGrange Development Authority who uh, owns, manages Oldham Reserve, Springs Park and LaGrange who are working on that new park in LaGrange, Springs Park, Leaders Don't Litter, and then the Oldham County Extension Office through their 4-H program. So with this, we're hoping to, and mentioned public trails at the Oldham Reserve. So if we get this, that'll start to fund some design on that. Uh, rain gardens, tree plantings, and educational signs is part of the work that's happening at Springs Park in LaGrange. 
And then we're hoping to create an environmental youth group that's going to be based on existing 4-H curriculum that focuses on streams. And then the second grant here, this is a Kentucky Association of Mitigation Managers Community Grant. Um, we're supposed to find out this week if we were funded. Uh, I don't know yet, but it's a $4,000 grant and we applied for this. So talking about live stakes, streamside plantings, we really don't have a great site in Oldham County to harvest a lot of live stakes. When we did those events this spring, I ended up ordering them because um, we don't have a big area to harvest and also just based on, you know, my time and weighing that in all of this. Um, but we have commitment from, from Olda to potentially take a couple of existing conservation area sites, so sites that are not going to be able to be developed, and to create this sustainably harvested area for live stakes, so planting trees where we can go in and cut, we can teach other people how to, how to cut um, for live stakes, and, and have this be a site where year after year people can go and harvest and we're just going to have that sustainable source, kind of like a tree farm. So if we get this grant, it will include those tree plantings, educational signage, and then community outreach on, on the project. And my last piece here is our wastewater cost share program. So that's our septic program. We've started that up this week. I've been giving a lot of presentations this week. So if I seem a little scattered, I apologize. Um, doing a lot of public speaking, but it went really well. Um, I think Charlie's in the same boat <laughs> here. Uh, so we met on Monday night and Wednesday night and we had 33 people attend. Cost share this time, it's gonna be a 50-50 cost share. So if somebody um, attended these workshops and they have an issue, they can submit an application. Those applications are all gonna be ranked based on our priority areas. Again, trying to target the most water quality improvements as well as factors like how close to the stream do people live, their lot size, their age of their system. And then Charlie is going to provide inspections. And if somebody has an issue and would like to participate in the program, they'll be able to do so. And we're going to run this until we run out of funding. We have $147,000 of federal funding. So at that 50-50 cost share, we're, we should be able to help at a minimum 21 homeowners. And that is all I have. I know I'm a little long-winded here. Uh, I can take if anybody has a question and I'll um, get presentation up here for, for Aaron and John. Okay. Let's see, so I'll get your presentation up here, Aaron. There we go. Thank you. And then I think that John was joining as well. Um, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi, John. All right. Yeah, I'm here. I can. Great. Yeah, I can hear you. Hello, everybody. Okay. Hi, John. Hello. All right. Well, I'll mute and you just tell me um, how to move the slide forward. <laughs> yeah, thank you for doing yeah. that, Becca. Um, my my connection just i don't know if it's just zoom but it constantly says like unstable so if i freeze up and need to um backtrack just please let me know okay and i do um, apologize I should, I should introduce you um no worries. so focusing on our theme of wastewater and human health uh, i've asked erin and she's brought uh, the msd engineer um, lead engineer i believe John here today to talk about uh, MS4's management of the Oldham County sewer system, which they took over last year. So um, I work with Erin in some other capacities and she is the environmental partnerships liaison, if I remember that correctly, with MSD. So stop there and let you take over. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, Becca, for having us today. Um, as Becca said, I am MSD's Environmental Partnerships Liaison. Um, I work in our executive office in intergovernmental relations, um, just supporting and developing MSD's partnerships at the local and national levels, um, just with the goal of 
strengthening the value of, of water um, as well as waterway health in our community. Um, and so as Becca said, I'm joined today by John Luckley, MSD Director of Engineering. And uh, John oversees MSD's engineering department and capital budget and our new services in Oldham County. So appreciate him being here today. Um, and um, so I, I sat in on a previous Curry's Pork meeting and just appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to introduce MSD today. I think that some of you are familiar with the work that Veolia is doing, um, all the great work that they are doing. And just today wanted to talk a little bit about MSD's background and our role in Oldham County alongside of Veolia. Um, so Becca, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So a, a little bit about MSD, we have three core services, wastewater, stormwater, and flood protection. And um, our vision and mission, as you see here, is for safe, clean waterways by protecting, uh, by providing quality wastewater, stormwater, and flood protection services to protect public health and safety through sustainable solutions, fiscal stewardship, and strategic partnerships. So we recognize this mission through our work every day. Um, for wastewater, every time you flush, shower, or wash, that water goes down the drain and into the sewer system. And so MSD treats that water um, and safely returns it to our environment, um, to our waterways and the Ohio River. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and so Louisville MSD was established under KRS 76 as a special district in 1946 to manage wastewater and sewer service in Jefferson County. Um, it wasn't until 12 years later in 1958 that the first water quality treatment center was built. Uh, before that time, wastewater in the community was released into the river and um, the Morris Foreman Water Quality Treatment Center was the first uh, facility in the state and it continues to serve our community. Um, I, I believe it's the largest facility in the Commonwealth uh, treating both dry weather and wet weather flows. Um, so today, MSD's wastewater and sewer services include 376 square miles of Louisville Metro and now portions of Oldham County. Um, and MSD also manages stormwater and flood protection in Louisville Metro. Um, to Becca's comments earlier about Oldham County's MS4 water quality program, MSD has a similar role in Louisville Metro. Um, so we're very familiar with that, managing the MS4 water quality permit program. Um, so in April 2018, the Kentucky State Legislature revised state law through House Bill 513 to allow wastewater utilities to own and operate assets outside of their jurisdictional boundaries. And so this is the bill that made um, the Oldham County regionalization efforts possible. And then nine months ago um, in July of last year, MSD completed the acquisition of the OSEA system and those 6,000 customers are um, now MSD customers. Veolia continues to be a critical partner in this effort by managing the day-to-day -day operations of the facilities. Um, so next slide. So um, our regional approach recognizes that streams and watersheds cross over political boundaries. This allows us as a community to see multiple benefits. First of all, that we are continuing to build on the amazing work and leadership from Veolia, but also broadening the customer base, 
producing economies of scale um, and just continuing to prioritize the health of local waterways as the community grows. Um, and so having that continuity of service through the Veolia team is incredibly important. Um, and all of this benefits the entire region. Next slide. And so here I will um, turn it over to John to talk a little bit more about um, the system. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Aaron asked me just to be part of this because I thought there might be some questions. Uh, and as we stated, we put a map together and this is the area, uh, the areas that are shaded and the treatment plants that are labeled. And what MSD did as part of the working with the Oldham County is, and I live in Oldham County, I'm, I'm in the Crestwood area. And I'll be honest with you, when I saw this map, I thought more of the county was Seward. And it's something that, that we will be working on, but these are the areas. And then the color shaded areas are the areas that uh, homes that are served by treatment plants, the rest are on home systems. Uh, basically, as Aaron stated, we took the system over. I'm, I'm the technical services director, so we work on the capital design engineering projects of things that work. I don't work with operations, but I will say that we work hand in with operations and it was very critical that Violi was part of this because, you know, we're still, uh, I, I don't make me light of it, but it's still sort of a new car and we're kicking the tires and figuring out how everything works. And, and we are in a process right now of, this is not a bad thing of, 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 of seeing what needs to be done and what needs to be changed to MSD standards and operations. And it's not that anything was done wrong before. It's just that everybody does things a little bit differently and, and how we report and, and how we go up the chain. But, you know, currently operations is just working on and getting everything and doing the repairs and stuff, working with Veolia. We are working on, for an example, telemetry. Uh, what's very critical and, and to all of our sites in Jefferson County is, is telemetry SCADA. And basically what that is, is it's the remote monitoring that does the flow, flow measurements, the data, and all the information that tells us how the systems are running. So for an example, we're, we're installing that at all the sites and that's been a pretty big issue. On capital projects, some of the things that we are moving forward with uh, in the Ohio River Water Quality Treatment Center area, which is the one on the far west of the county in that purplish color. We do have some capital projects to work on some pump stations. Uh, there are several pump stations that uh, were in the process of Veolia of improving them. And we are moving forward with that. Uh, the design is about 95% done and we're starting to get the easements. It's a Cardinal Harbor pump station, the Cliffwood pump station and uh, the club drive pump station. So those will be replaced. Those two will be replaced and club drive will be eliminated. They're old original pump stations originally constructed. So they're gonna be brought back up to, to good operating standard. And then I think the next slide, uh, well, real quick before you go to the next, sorry, before you do that, uh, of the treatment plants we have, we uh, in Jefferson County, one of the big things we had, uh, and I always think it's amazing that at one time there was 90 uh, various different class cities or entity in the county. It's pretty significant and they all had their own system. So there was almost 300 uh, licensed or certified or, or, or discharge points into our waterways. And we've knocked that down to only five. So there's five treatment plants. Uh, we, it's always better. It helps improve water quality. Anytime you can take a smaller plant and divert the flow to a larger plant. So one of the projects we are definitely working on now, and it was part of our acquisition, even before the acquisition we were working on this, is at the bottom of that, of that screen, you see the Ash Avenue uh, Water Quality Treatment Center. And I believe it's the next slide. We are working on the interceptor uh, that will, oh, sorry, but we'll get to that. This is, there you go. We're working on right now, that's about 90% designed. We are getting the funds. And the goal will be is to have that in place. And by the end of 2021 uh, or the beginning of, it looks like by the end of 2022, that plant will be offline, which will definitely improve uh, the quality. It is a plant that I just be honest, it's beyond its useful usefulness. And it has a lot of wet weather. There's some peaking factors of uh, 14, 15, 
uh, when it rains. And Veoli has done a wonderful job and they've gone in there and knocked out a lot of it. But this flow will go to our regional Floyd's Fork Water Quality Treatment Center, which is a six and a half MGD station. And it's designed for this flow and it's designed and, and sort of definitely in treatment, there's economy to scale and the uh, improvement of scale as far as that you're treating, the bigger the plant is, the better it can, it can do it and the better it can improve the waterway. So Erin uh, just said, if I could be part of it, this part of her, she wanted to talk about the MS4, but just, just to show some of the things that we're doing, at least right now, as far as the first, I guess it's the first nine or 10 months of our acquisition of the system. And I do think she added that one slide just to kind of show uh, what we have as far as in the, in, in the current fork area. So it's the shaded areas are the areas that uh, we have the sewers in and are working on those. I don't know if anybody has any other questions. Um, I believe the last slide has all of our contact information. So we're always around and you can, if you don't have any questions today, you can always send us emails in the future. I have a question probably for clarification because this is a little bit um, what I, I don't work with sewers as much. So, so for this Lakewood Valley um, treatment plant, for example, is it only treating this area in green or is it receiving other wastewater as well? It's only treating the areas in green. Okay. So that's why, that's why I kind of was joking at the beginning of it is that, uh, I mean, I live in, uh, I live uh, in orchard grass or outside of, in, a, in, a, in the part of Crestwood area. And, and I, I just, for some reason thought there was more sewer homes in the area, but now there might be some other private sewers that we don't show, or there is, well, Pee Wee Valley, they don't have it, or what is in the LaGrange treatment plant, which we don't have on here, but the treatment plants that we have, that we are control over are what is on this map, and that's the shaded area. So for your example, all those homes, unless there's another way and they're going somewhere else, which I don't know of, only what's in the green in that specific area is what's going to that treatment plant. Uh, John, on uh, this is Kevin Jeffries. Uh, hey, sir. Uh, quick, quick question about the down at the uh, uh, Asher Run, the, 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 the interceptor that you all are putting in down there at Pee Wee Valley, Ash Avenue. That, yes, you say that, that will be up and running by the end of the year. Is that what I'm hearing? The end of 2022. Oh, 2022. The plan, okay. should, the plan should be offline in 2022. We had a great order to have it offline February of 2023. Right. And we always try to beat that. So it should be offline. And, and actually, uh, it, it'll tie into a project that's almost done now that was put in place. It's going to eliminate the Shelby County, the KCIW, the Women's Corrections Treatment Plan is going to be eliminated shortly. And then we will extend that line up to get the Ash Avenue and it'll provide uh, it is sized for the gravity watershed. So, you know, whether it's existing homes that do assessment projects that, that want to tie on and get rid of their septic systems or it's future development, it's, it's, it's a 30 inch diameter interceptor. And I had it here, it's approximately, uh, I don't have it, but it's a 30 inch interceptor. It's approximately 6,000 linear feet. So okay. it's a significant work. And that'll take uh, all of that uh, uh, sewer to the new plant there along 71 down by Ladders Quarry? Uh, no, it'll take it to the plant on 71 is Height Creek. Okay. Uh, right. This will take it to the Floyd's Fork treatment plant. And it's part of that Floyd's Fork, uh, Miles Park, kind of across from US 60 at, at, at Bell Hollow Golf Course. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. All yeah. right. It'll take it there. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Anytime, any questions, please. If, and again, like I said, if you think of something, I always do that. I always hear these presentations and on my drive home, I think of questions. So we're available. Yeah. Any other questions for John or Aaron? We really appreciate you coming and sharing this with us today. Anytime. Thanks for having us. And I will stop sharing my screen here. Move stuff out of the way. And thanks, Harley, thanks, what, Aaron. Sorry, what was that? I just said thanks, everybody. Nice meeting you. You too. Thank you, John. All right. So next up, we have Charlie Ward. So Charlie, as I mentioned, we work together on our septic system program. But I thought it was 
um, kind of pertinent to talk about what Charlie's been doing as of late, which as you probably would have guessed has been COVID response in Oldham County. So Charlie's gonna provide an update for us on that work. And you should be able to share your screen whenever you're ready. All right, everyone can see the picture of the health department building? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right. Let's see if I can just not mess this up even worse. Did that make it worse? No, you can still see the building? Yep. Okay. All right, so yes, I'm Charlie Ward. I'm the environmental director here at the Oldham County Health Department. Um, normally, Beck has got me out in the field running down delinquent septic systems and educating and informing homeowners. So if I have any more Zoom meetings with her this week, Three. So um, just to kind of go over with the health department here and what we've been doing, uh, normal day-to-day -day functions here with environmental are, again, a lot of it on-site septic programs, doing inspections for pools, schools, hotels, everything and all things involved with public health, dog bites, mold, lead. Um, a lot of things have been put on kind of a hold right now because our main concentration previously with the COVID pandemic was testing and contact tracing, and now it's all about vaccination. Um, even today, we have a vaccine clinic that's going to be running until four o'clock, and I think we're going to be doing between 350 and 400 people by the end of the day, and the people coming today are getting boost doses. So these are people that were here 28 days prior. Um, I guess kind of before we get into the COVID thing, I guess one of the things Becca wanted me to touch on was um, COVID and wastewater, that there was some studies, there hasn't been anything done here in Oldham County, but they were trying to study to see if any of the RNA uh, was transferring into our wastewater or eventually into our creeks and streams and then running the risk of, say I went down to the creek and stream and was down there splashing around, could I catch COVID from that waterway? Um, I think part of the science is like anything when it comes to some of the diseases, E. coli and those that are carried through fecal coliform is yes, that COVID was being shed through your waste and being, if it was unproperly treated, could be put as a point source into the creeks and streams. Now, I'm like, you know, all things related when it comes to wastewater and treatment. Ideally, those viruses are going to be killed and naturally denatured if they can go through a conventional septic system. It's just so bad. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, but under normal circumstances with a regular septic system, using the soil and what's provided on your property, you're denaturing all that bacteria, all those viruses, all those pathogens. So as far as the role of contamination, very minimal, if, if any at all. But I would still think it's a concern where if you were in, say, an area near a discharge plant of some sort where there was, you know, okay, what could potentially be in this waterway, like even going down to Florida's Fork, I still wouldn't be drinking or ingesting any water because Gerardia cyst, other bacterium, E. coli, you just don't run the risk of getting involved with it. So um, just to go through with the COVID response that we've had here at the health department and show you all some figures, um, being that my role normally was environmental, it now turns into the logistics coordinator. So I was in charge of gathering all the PPE that was coming in on the national stockpile, redistributing it to all the hospitals, the schools, daycare centers, dentist offices, um, we've moved hundreds of thousands of items of PPE. Our, our first shipment was enough to fill basically the new building or the new uh, building with the swing in the section of the back of the health department was full of one end from one end to the other head high with masks, gowns, gloves, face shields. Um, I've been running bootleg sanitizer for like the last eight months down from the Kentucky distillery. Um, it's, it's very awful stuff, but I was told I could drink it, but I'm not even going to attempt it. Um, <laughs> But our role here has just been providing any entity around the community that's trying to be open and open being correctly, you know, providing with the guidance of what to do. Um, at one point, yes, we were the mask police. We did enforcement with masking issues. Uh, again, I see our position here is education and information. Let's educate these business owners why they need to be doing these things rather than just slapping them with fines and citations. Again, collecting money from someone as a cop out to not have to wear a mask. You just pay a fine. But let me educate you and let me provide you with some PPE so you can you know, have better practice and safer management. So just to go through the, the slides here and see the numbers. 
So you can see that the, this was back to the total case count of positive cases here in Oldham County. Um, the total case count was almost at 7,500. We had almost 84 deaths. Um, you'll see a lot of MMR, which is the morbidity and mortality rate that's going on here. Um, just to see as far as Oldham County versus Kentucky itself, we, we weren't one of the worst counties, but we weren't by any means the best county. Um, I think between with our proximity to, to Jefferson County, we have a lot of travel and commerce between people working in Jefferson, living in Oldham, so our numbers can get slightly fluctuated. Um, this was the positive COVID lab results. So you can see over the last 12 weeks, um, the peaks that are on the chart themselves, you can probably correlate those to Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, anytime there was ever a gathering, um, you would always see a spike of positive test results coming back. And again, just another present week from beginning of the year to where we are now. You can see where there's that second week of the year that was right after Christmas and New Year's. And then luckily we've been trending very, very lowly. We've definitely flattened the curve out and we're keeping our, our, our rates lowest that we've had before. Um, and a lot of that we're hoping is contributing to vaccinations. So there was the confirmed and probable cases. You can see everyone on the left was an actual confirmed. You heard a lot of those people were probable. These were people, let's say, um, living in the household with someone. There were a spouse or significant other that was living with someone that was a confirmed case, but due to high risk exposure, they were presumed probable that they had it. Those probable cases were never confirmed with an actual positive test result. It was just saving the time and anguish of having someone to go get tested, go out, and then be out there. They were just presumed prob you know, probable. Um, this is the distribution over the last 12 weeks of ages, where we from have, you know, zero to nine year olds at the beginning and then 90 to 99 year olds. Basically, the data is showing it's middle aged people, um, older than 30, younger than 80. Most of the people that are out and about and, and amongst the public and, and out in businesses. Um, this is this distribution by, by ethnicity here in the county. Um, a lot of people just left it unknown and did not answer, but again, majority of people being white and a few African-American, Asians, and Hispanic multiracial populations as well, but majority being those that identify as being white. Um, total cases as far as male versus female, um, there have been significantly more men than women um, that have come down with COVID. Um, I think at one point we kind of made the correlation that we, we really vaccinated very heavily with the schools and the teachers. Um, historically, women have been more teachers than men in the past. So that was kind of something like, well, why is this number? Uh, and again, I think it's the age old tale that men were just not, we're, we're hard headed. We don't want to go to the doctors. I don't need to get a shot. Nothing's going to kill me. And then lo and behold, you get hit by a Mack truck the next day. So um, back to reporting on diseases of those that were ever hospitalized in ICU and those that have recovered. So the, the good number you can see down at the bottom is that, that over 7,000 people have recovered from having COVID. Um, our hospitalization rate was a little higher there, but we do have a hospital here in the county. So at least knowing we had that facility available for those local people here was, was a great asset. Um, and then this goes back to the deaths that would happen here in the county of the total deaths that we had, which were 84. Again, majority of them 61 being male. Um, and only 23 females that were to it. There were, uh, at one point we probably heard that long-term care facilities had a very large problem as far as keeping with close confinement and then people transferring the virus amongst themselves. Uh, almost half of these actually came from long-term care facilities. Those being elderly people or those that were in some kind of weakened immune system state. Um, so bow to the vaccine update. So this is kind of the good news and where we're coming from. So these are the list of all of the Providers here in the county, um, originally with the role that was here at the health department and the Grange Baptist Center, and then slowly the Walmart, Walgreens, Kroger's, CVS, other places came online as a secondary site to get your vaccinations. So totaled administered vaccinations, we have done over 25,000 people. That's in a combination of this 14,000 and 10,000 at the bottom, where that's total administered doses, be it either prime dose and boost dose, or the combination of both of them, where you've just had a prime but not yet your boost. So we're Numbers are getting there. We're not likely, uh, we're not as high as what we'd like to be as far as reaching that herd immunity, but it is getting there. Um, even today, again, we've had between 350, 400 people. Next Tuesday, we'll have another vaccination clinic of boost dose. That will be our second highest day ever from the prime dose for this one, where it's to be just about 900 people will come in um, 
from nine in the morning till nine in the about well, eight o'clock in the evening to get their boosters. So those are, yes, people receiving at least one dose in the county. There's Moderna, Pfizer, and the uh, Johnson Johnson. Um, majority of what we were ever given here and was the Moderna vaccine. We were given some J&J, &J, but we decided not to actually go through with that. We were gonna leave that out for some long-term care facilities and correctional facilities just to cut down on that second visit that wouldn't be required with the J&J. &J. And then just to break that amongst of those of the providers that are here to people in Oldham County as far as distribution going. Um, the one that I can toot my own horn in, if you look at all the way to the far right, the health department has vaccinated far more many people than anyone else, which I'm proud to say uh, many years ago, a lot of people we talk about the health department. Well, what's that? What does the health department do? It's like where I go to get condoms or babies get socks and vaccination records. Well, I hate to say that the pandemic kind of really brought us into the limelight with everything, but it, it kind of took us from out of the shadows and threw us out there into it like, oh, hey, yeah, the health department, I've been there. I know where that is now. Like, no, we don't have the old building where Violi is over at 146. We're, we've been on Commerce Parkway for many years now. Um, vaccination by gender, you can see this is kind of the one here. Um, at least at this point, we're getting closer to where the men and women are, are, are actually vaccinating closer with each other. So there's still been several thousand more women than men, but I'm trying my best to get other guys out there. Hey, look, you know, you're not, you're not totally invincible if not for you, for someone else, because again, you can still get the disease, you can still transmit it and let's not affect other people as well. Um, just to break down vaccination among groups, the number of 17 and under is very low because at one point 18 and you know, it had to be 18 or older to receive any vaccine. Um, but you can see again, we've done a lot of people uh, 18 and older have come through and that younger demographic, we're trying to push them as well. I know they're not a high risk and it was mainly, you know, Let's start with the 80s, the 70s, the 60s. And then once we got to the 50s, we just were like, forget it. We're, we're not gonna go bookending anymore. It's opening to everyone. As long as you're 18 or older, we don't care what you do, where you work for, everyone needs to get vaccinated. That wants to get vaccinated, let them come in. Um, and again, this is just the baseline of those that have been vaccinated by race. You can see um, not as much diversity as what we could have in other instances, but again, we are trying to reach out to some of the other groups besides just white people here in the county to, to try and get everyone as we can vaccinated as much as possible. This is just us here at the clinics. I'm the goofy guy in the hat with wearing the striped trout mask, of course, because that's just me. Um, we've been here at the health department day in and day out. We've been over at Crestwood Baptist Church. Uh, that's when we did corrections and teachers. We've also been at the Oldham County High School doing those teachers there as well. Um, we did a couple of days over at EMS because we try to set up uh, three vaccination lanes where we're trying to get, I think that goal at the end of the day was like another 800 people with a vaccination clinic and, and having people wait, we're trying to deter the whole, like you hear a lot of negative where people went to Louisville and they sat out broadband for like two to three hours, 30 minutes, I promise you, 30 minutes. If you even if you have to come here and fill up paperwork, you get your shot and wait your 15 minutes for you know the recommendation to make sure you don't have any reaction, no more than 30 minutes is here at the health department. So we're really proud of how fluid that we're trying to get everyone and get them out and, and do numbers as much as we can. Um, all right, so yes, yeah, so this is the total vaccination numbers just to break down again of men, women, um, white, black, African-Americans and multiracials and Hispanics. Charlie, and is that- is, yeah, just, Yes, Kevin. Yeah, just a quick question on that, uh, the vaccination, uh, the, is that the, the numbers that you all did just from the health department or is that the total of uh, Oldham County residents? That this will be all of everyone that's actually registered or, or as a resident here in Oldham County. Um, right, there was a lot of folks I think went to Jefferson County, you know, yep. to hospitals and whatever, or mm -hmm. U of L and I, I went to U of L and got mine. And so I wasn't sure whether like, Mine would be included in these numbers or not. Ideally, whenever, and this is how I can't speak to how other agencies are doing, but what we've done is when you come in here, you enter a PEF form, which is basically a demographic. It's going to be your name, your birthday, some kind of identifiers of where you live, because then mm -hmm. the idea is that your vaccine, when you receive it, is stored in a national database. So that way, even if you lose your card, mm -hmm. someone can still look you up and look up your address and say, oh yeah, here's you know your shot records that you've had over the years. That's kept in a national database. So hopefully that information is then being kind of put together and then separate it back out into regions itself. Um, okay. Because that's where I have this information where this is vaccination by zip code. Um, of course, a lot of these are just gonna be correlation to where population density is here in the county itself. So of course you can see it goes LaGrange, Crestwood, Goshen, Peewee Valley, then Westport, and then 
Buckner is a small percent just because, you know, Buckner doesn't does exist, but I joke it's like Ballardsville and Smithfield. Like they don't have post offices. So like who really lives in Ballardsville that's just right. eaten up by Crestwood. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, and then just as questions to come through it. So uh, Megan Hurst is our epidemiologist. She's been an integral part in getting all this information together. Matt Rhodes is our new environmental director. He's been with us for about six months. I'm sure you've probably seen him a couple of times on the news speaking out. Um, and Leanne Comer, she is our part of our preparedness education supervisor. Um, whenever there's anything that's gonna be like uh, pods or if we have to open up anything to hand out prophylactics to people, um, she is our head coordinator with that. And I kind of help facilitate everything with her because me being logistics, it's like, Charlie, we need this. Okay, I go get that. Or, oh, it's gonna be raining. Okay, I'm setting up a tent. Or when it was cold, I was scrounging around to find heat for everybody because we were rain, sleet, snow or shine. We were outside vaccinating people because that's what we needed to do. And that's what we wanna be doing right now is vaccinating as many people as we possibly can. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing that. I think I have asked too much of you this week. You said Matt was the environmental director. <laughs> I said Matt was environmental director. That's because you said that yesterday. Because I was like, no, he's not. I am. No, no, you called me so. the health department director. That's what it was. I was like, no, I'm not that guy. I'm the environmental director. Oh, well, we both need a break. It was late last night. Okay, it was nine o'clock. Yeah, we've been we've been on till about eight thirty. Um, well, thank you for that. Does anybody have any questions for Charlie related to COVID or other topics? I'll just I'll just say thank you to Charlie and the whole health department. I think because before the pandemic, you guys were so busy, and Charlie, we see you frequently with building permits because building permits are going through the roof right now, and a lot of those are septic. They're not all on sanitary sewers, so you're still busy doing those inspections. You're helping uh, Becca with our Curry's Fork Watershed uh, Septic Repair Program. You get thrown in the pandemic and that takes up a ton of your time. So you know, kudos to your whole group. Thank you. No, you all are very welcome. Like I said, I, I am totally a public servant. I enjoy helping people more than I help myself. And I understand, you know, it's unfortunate that this is my first pandemic being here at the health department and being here almost nine years. You know, I, I missed out on swine flu. Um, I wasn't part of hepatitis, but that wasn't nearly like this now. So. Um, I always talk about, well, hey, it's job security, right? You know, I don't <laughs> but to a point I'm like, I must be a glutton for punishment because I keep coming back day in and day out, but, but I love it. Working here has been great. All right. Well, we've got a few minutes left. If anybody has questions you've thought of since the beginning or anything you want to share about what you're doing or anything at all. Okay, you've done um, a good job today, I think, uh, putting this together. So it seemed like we've got a lot of good information here. Thanks. Yeah, definitely a team effort. Um, Becca, I think I missed what Aaron said before about MS4. I had walked away from my screen for a few minutes, but I know y'all were talking about MS4 and the and stormwater. I missed that. I think it had to do with that. So. Oh. Yeah, I can. I, I think I was just mentioning that, um, you know, MSD's role in Oldham County um, is serving um, in the wastewater and sewer capacity. And just that, you know, MSD does have a familiarity with um, the MS4 program as we manage that for Louisville Metro. Um, and just that we have that familiarity, we have, um, you know, uh, rec we re recognize all the work that goes into that, that, that you all are doing. Okay. Uh, Becca, just one thing. I, I, I know uh, we didn't, you know, introduce ourselves to everybody or whatever, but I just wanted to let folks know that, that I also serve on the state ag development uh, water resources board. And there are uh, pretty substantial funds available for agriculture uh, in, in well, statewide, or, but especially, I mean, in Oldham County, if there are some folks that you all are familiar with that 
that need to either uh, water quality uh, help or water quantity help. There's some uh, ag development funds that are available to uh, apply for that uh, that we meet quarterly to uh, distribute statewide. So there's you know there's some pretty substantial dollars there. If there's some folks in in that you know that are still farming, there's still a lot of cattle and things in Oldham County. So there's some you know some dollars available if uh, anybody needs uh, some help along those lines. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. And mm -hmm. did anybody else not get a chance to introduce themselves or wants to introduce themselves to the group? Feel free. Um, if not, I do have a video. If it'll show, you're welcome to head out anytime. Um, I know we're, we're before four o'clock, so I don't want to keep you either way. Um, but I did take a video of the live stakes plantings and maybe just as we're Heading out, if you want to take a look, if it'll play, I don't know how great the quality is going to be here, but I will attempt to play this. And can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So for some context, I mentioned that we planted bare, bare root seedlings and live stakes along the Oldham Reserve. So kind of took a before and after, and this is the after. So the seedlings are a little harder to see, but you'll be able to see those stakes a little bit better. stop it there. But we did get a pretty good portion of the, the stream planted, so I'm excited to see what that ends up looking like. And if there's no other questions or you all don't want to, don't have anything to add, um, I thank you so much for your time and uh, appreciate Appreciate you being here and definitely feel free if something comes up you want to talk about, reach out to me. Okay. Thanks, Becca. Thanks. Thank you, Becca.